So good afternoon and welcome. Um, we're thr thrilled to have Val at WNL. That doesn't happen often. So um, thank you, Stephanie, for coordinating this and everybody else um, who is involved. Um, we'll have to make this happen more frequently. Um, I am the director of the Law Library, and um, we've just introduced um, John Jacob, who is our archivist. Um, he'll be speaking shortly, uh, as well as Stephanie um, Miller, who is our electronic services librarian. Um, the title of our program is The Necessity, the Plan, and the Payoff. I'm going to speak briefly as to sort of the why behind our institutional repository that we call Scholarly Commons. Um, Stephanie is going to uh, address sort of the, the practical aspects as to how this actually came to be. Um, and um, then John Jacob is going to speak um, to something we're very invested and proud of, which is our archival feature that's contained within Scholarly Commons. Um, I want to give a nod out to one more person who was highly instrumental in, um, in making scholarly comments happen, and um, he's well known to everybody in this room, Jack. <laughs> um, Jack was here at the concept phase, um, and he and his staff, um, along with really every member of the WNL staff, um, made this happen for us, so thank you. Um, so, to my question, why? Why should a law library invest a substantial amount of their resources, scarce resources at that, um, in scholarly comments? We started this conversation uh, and this concept um, back in 2009, 2010. At that point, there were essentially three conversations taking place in this building. The first one was at the administrative level, and that conversation was, basically began and ended with the concept of cost containment. Obviously, um, the financial crisis of 2008 was well um, in everyone's um, mind. Um, it was felt distinctly um, in our law library budget, uh, but it was felt really um, at all levels of the, the university here. Um, we were fortunate that we avoided layoffs and furloughs, uh, but fiscal constraint, that was the, um, the measure that ruled any conversation involving new projects, and in particular, um, personnel. Our faculty was having a slightly different conversation at the same time. Uh, they were focused on a conversation regarding best practices for promotion and dissemination of scholarship. Um, SSRN was truly ruling that conversation, as well as the accessibility. Um, yeah, and the other question that was coming up frequently within that um, context was, is there more? Are we missing something? How do we get our scholarship out there? Um, so that was taking place um, in the halls uh, and in and around our faculty offices. The third conversation that was going on was within the library. Um, we had just finished drafting a new collection development policy. Um, that policy focuses on access to information. Um, we had also started and um, by 2010 completed a strategic planning process. We had signed the um, Duran statement regarding um, open access and moving our um, law journals into that format. So our internal conversations at that point were um, within the library were focused around a series of questions. Um, those questions were, um, what is the concept of service to faculty? What services can we realistically offer with our existing resources? Uh, what staff might we redeploy? What is our obligation to our community? Um, and we define community very broadly. Um, and then last but not least, there was an on-again, off-again repository initiative at the university level uh, that was in strong favor by our provost. So if you take all these three conversations and wrap them together, our challenge was how to respond. And specifically, we wanted to address the faculty conversations. Um, more importantly, though, how to respond within the context of no new resources, no new money, no new personnel. Um, if you think back, the um, open access movement began in the 90s. It, was a, it had a, a distinct focus on promoting access to scholarship, um, and there was a desire here that we needed to move the scholarly and intellectual um, content of this building out from behind that paywall, most, um, most frequently Westwall, Lexis, Hine, EBSCO, ProQuest. Um, we were also cognizant that SSRN was a distinct um, conversation. WNL has its own institutional repository within the SSR community. Our faculty, much like all law faculty, regularly populate SSRN with their prepense. And so part of our question, uh, and one of the questions we knew we needed to face with the administration is, 
why is there a need, a duplicative need at that, for an, a, a second access point, specifically in light of the fact that there is a defined scarcity of resources? Uh, this was particularly a, a problematic conversation when you think that SSRN is the top-ranked um, open access repository in the world, and almost all law scholarship is first published there. So again, why go to this expense of creating our own institutional repository? We found that the answer lay in conversations regarding the uh, promotion and preservation. SSRN, we determined, was an incomplete answer to the questions facing us. Our goal we defined as sharing our scholarly output openly in a way that maximized exposure and promoted not only uh, the individual scholar but also the institution. Uh, we wanted to reach an audience uh, larger than the one that SSRN. SSRN has a very uh, loyal but a relatively small um, audience when you um, consider um, its footprint. Um, so, how do you, again, uh, to, to borrow a phrase from Carol Watson, maximize the number of eyeballs on papers? In specific, we determined that uh, an IR was an excellent tool uh, to call attention to the content that we wanted to um, focus on. Um, and it would, um, was one we could um, maximize by using simple Google keyword searching. We also sought to create what we call, um, and it was what was often referred to as the long tail of scholarship. SSRN does a great job at the short tail. So if you look at SSRN, download um, uh, interest uh, and download counts tend to peak within the first five weeks of a, a paper being introduced into the repository. By contrast, when you look at institutional repositories, uh, they were breathing new life into older works and um, substantially extending the, um, the number of um, eyeballs on those works. So um, our answer truly lay in that we were ready to maximize our resources, um, create a uh, rate of return, and the tool that we determined that we needed was our institutional repository. Um, it was a way to maximize the intellectual output of this building um, and something near and dear to John's heart, it was a manner in which we could address our preservation concerns. So our answer to why an institutional repository was return on investment required at the faculty, administrative, and library levels. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie and let her tell you how this came to be. So I'm going to get into the, sort of the nitty gritty of it. Um, so the development of our repository really came about in two stages. Uh, the first stage took us through selecting the tool, selecting Digital Commons versus other institutional repository platforms, um, pre-populating some, uh, some of our content, like our journal series and our faculty scholarship, um, and then going live and introducing scholarly commons to the law school community. And then the second stage was creating a written plan, um, something that would guide us going forward as we continue to add content uh, to a repository that was available uh, to the community and to the Googleverse. So I will start with what we usually call the pre-plan, um, and that's selecting the tool, uh, pre-populating some of our series, and um, before we went live. So we had to select a tool, and before we came to decide on Digital Commons, uh, we did some experimenting with DSpace. Uh, the university library here has a successful uh, DSpace repository, among other tools that they use to disseminate scholarship. And uh, that instance of DSpace is associated with a consortium. Um, but we quickly learned through, through that experiment, um, after taking a couple of our faculty authors and uploading some of the work and sort of trying our hand at actually using the platform, um, we decided that we really, we needed, we needed more from a platform than that could give us. We're, we're not programmers, I'm not a programmer, um, but one of those things um, that we needed was support. We also needed some more flexibility with customization and um, especially with regard to the metadata fields and, and things that were specific to our needs. Um, but from that ex experiment, we, we were really able to identify our priorities and what we were looking for when we would select that platform, and those turned out to be flexibility, customization, and support. 
But we also gained some important information and experience working with the University Council through that process. We walked away uh, with a very well-formulated license agreement that our faculty signed to permit us to put their work in the repository. And we also um, came away with a directive that we must obtain permission from our, pub our faculty's publishers before we add the full text of a work to the repository. So we dove in with digital comments. Uh, we would take on the development and the management of the repository with existing library resources, um, that's funding and staffing. Um, and after the choice was made to proceed uh, with digital commons, we had to upload uh, quite a lot of content in the beginning to make this a viable project. One of our major concerns was that we would have sort of this empty shell of a project uh, that was out there that maybe didn't represent, uh, it looked half finished or maybe it didn't represent the organization well and that's something that we were very concerned with uh, before we, we went live and we made uh, this available. So the very first project that we took on to pre-populate scholarly commons before we went live was uploading the back issues of our, uh, our journals, our flagship law review and the other journals. And this was, this was really a truly hands-on deck effort uh, in the library. The digital issues were, the digitized issues were acquired from Hein. And uh, with the help from BE Press, we used Dropbox and their batch uploading tools to add the issues one by one to scholarly comments. And I'll talk a little bit more about workflow later, but this is the finest example. Library staff everywhere in the library, from collection services, circulation, public services, everybody had a hand um, in making this, making this start. Um, staff was uploading, all of the libraries were adding disciplines and keywords to each individual article, but it was, it was really a collective effort. Um, so before we went live, we had um, nearly 70 volumes of our flagship law review uploaded, and it, the repository was dark until, until we had that done. It was important to us to have a mass of content uh, before, before we made this available for everyone to see. We also made an initial push for uploading faculty scholarship. We met with our faculty individually. We explained to them um, the license agreement that we had and how we would be managing the copyright permissions process for them. Um, that, was, that was a priority for them as well as for us. And with, um, with, these, with these projects continually um, growing, we knew that it was, it was really time to sit down and, and make a plan for the future and how we would proceed over time. So much of our progress in populating uh, digital commons repositories flowed from the drafting of this working plan. Uh, we took the time to identify the collections that we wanted to add to the repository, the materials that would populate that collection, the priority in which we would tackle them, and, and the staff that would, uh, that would assist in, in making it all happen. And that's really in contrast to you know, putting the pedal to the metal and just start uploading everything that I could get my hands on, which is what sometimes I want to do when I have new technology to play with. But this really forced us to address all of those things in advance before, before we got started. We had to think things through. And when it comes to actual content, we divided our projects into continuing content projects, things that would um, continue producing new content over, over time, like our journals, publishing new issues, and our faculty that are always publishing new, um, new material. And, and that's where, where I'll go from here. So now when a new issue of the Law Review is published, it comes to Jack and the Collection Services staff. And because they were such an essential component of adding uh, the archives uh, that we acquired from Hind to the repository, uh, they're familiar with the process and the issue is issues added to the repository from there. And our other continuing pro content project is our faculty scholarship series. And this is undoubtedly the most complex content project that we're working on because it involves so many players other than the librarians and the library staff. Here we're dealing with the faculty um, and our challenge there has been an open line of communication so that we really know when they have something new coming, when something's in the pipeline or when something's just come out. Uh, and communicating with them and finding, uh, finding what's new has been our biggest challenge, but we've a, a combination of inquiries, frequent inquiries and some alerts um, have kept us on top of that. To date, we have about uh, work from 26 of our 30 permanent faculty members in the faculty scholarship series. And we're, we're pushing, uh, I think, about 300 articles. So the other player there is obviously the publishers. Um, we work to acquire permission from the publishers before we post as well. I'll talk about a little bit more about that in just a moment. So uh, the what? Uh, our first priority is our faculty's journal articles, and among the journal articles, those that were published during their time at WNL. All our faculty lives in one single series in the repository. And when we learn of a new publication, we try and acquire permission uh, right away while it's still fresh and new in everyone's mind. 
So this leads us to the question of copyright. Um, as I mentioned before, our university council has advised us that it's necessary for us to acquire permission from the copyright owner of each article before we post in scholarly comments. Um, and this is certainly not the only way to take on the project. Uh, there are many successful repositories out there that, for example, forego the request to a student-run journal. And then our decisions to obtain permission from all the law journals um, is not necessarily out of, out of legal necessity, but, but a choice to take the most conservative route. Um, and we've also noticed a trend in our faculty that publishing in a lot of interdisciplinary journals. So they're not just publishing in the traditional law reviews and the student-run journals, but they're publishing in a lot of journals in other fields, a lot of those uh, by commercial publishers. So this, to us, was also a, um, a matter of streamlining the process. So whenever a faculty member publishes, the, it goes through the same steps uh, for the permissions process, whether it was published in the student-run journal or whether it was published in a journal by Taylor and Francis. And we've also recently expanded uh, the content in scholarly comments to include some student scholarship. Um, Digital Commons has given us the tools, for example, to filter from our journal series and filter out just the award winners. We, every year we have the Roy L. Steinheimer Award and the Law Council Award. Um, and so now we can feature this student scholarship. Uh, we can embed a video of their law note presentation um, on the item page so a user can arrive, they can download the paper, they can watch the video of the presentation all in one place. And so to talk about some more of our discrete content projects, in particular, um, the things that we find in the Powell Papers and the mm -hmm. archives, I'm going to turn things over to Tom. Thanks, uh, Things are looking out for special collections departments and libraries. It's become almost a cliche by now to say that while libraries are rethinking their role as storehouses of books, of, of so-called uh, commodity publications, um, the Special collections, the, the, the importance of special collections as it defines institution is, is becoming more no, noteworthy. The uh, image of, the, of dusty books, dusty shelves, dusty curator is giving, uh, is giving way to an awareness of, of the role that these rare and unique materials uh, play in, in the identity of an institution. Not surprisingly, this uh, change in fortune has not come with uh, increased staff and budget, but uh, fortunately law librarians and selected faculty and, and staff members are coming around to the thoughts uh, long held by archivists that um, placing materials and, and, and making one's institutional, um, institutionally distinctive uh, materials available in electronic systems that provide the broadest possible access and with, along with the best possible preservation is a good way to go. It doesn't really matter that um, some faculty uh, think that um, these seminal documents of a school begin and end with their, their scholarship. Uh, the wise archivist doesn't, uh, doesn't chide colleagues with deeper pockets by um, pointing out their, uh, that we've thought this way a long time. Um, something along the lines of that, that's a brilliant idea, is, is, is a good retort. In my own case, uh, having the always forward-looking Caroline as, as my director and funding this project, and with Jack Bissett and Stephanie setting up the uh, protocols, uh, special the door was really open for special collections, and we eagerly walked through. That's kind of the royal week, and it's just me. Um, and, uh, talking uh, with Stephanie, we easily decided what collections and formats we should go after first, and we um, pick things like the, the Powell case files. Uh, most of you were down in my uh, bunker and, and saw uh, some of those things. And so we chose those and some speeches he made. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the things that I had done as far in the way of online exhibits and, uh, were also included. And we left some of the more uh, problematic formats to later on, but I must say that we're really moving forward with uh, an alacrity that I, I couldn't have foreseen. You should never underestimate uh, Stephanie's energies and, and uh, enthusiasm, to spend, which were stoked by a recent uh, conference, uh, B Press conference that she and, and Caroline attended. So we're really getting into those uh, moving images and sound and so forth uh, even faster than I could have hoped. Uh, these are some of the forms of materials that you would typically find 
in special collections, manuscripts, in, in this case I'm talking about collections of personal papers, archives, the records of your, entire records of your institution. Photographs, of course, are always um, a great way and, and, and a favorite way among the public to um, document your history. And then I, I talked about the auto recordings and the video recordings and so on. Um, here's, here are a couple of examples of uh, personal papers from Justice Powell's collection. One is from the time that he was uh, in uh, abroad in World War II, he was writing to his daughter. You can see some of the uh, nibblings that, that some insects made in, in Paul had kind of things, but uh, he was calling her Sonny, which was her nickname, dear son. And then all the way, here you see him at, at the height of his Powers 1977, uh, his signature case, the Bakken case. These are some notes he made from the conferences. But in any case, uh, all, all these things can be made available to uh, everyone. The clientele for this is not just, of course, in our building, but it's, it's nationwide and worldwide. So this is uh, a great way to make these things available. Um, archives can be a, a little more problematic. You're obviously not going to put the records of your institution from last week um, online, and you have to be careful about, about the guidelines. But here you see some things uh, older. A, a, a recent graduate of uh, WNL in 1936, uh, Louis F. Powell Jr., uh, writes to the dean saying, I'm, I'm really sorry that the law building burned down, but it really sucked anyway. And uh, if, uh, I don't think that all these bricks and concrete and steel could light up, but if the same fate happened here, you'd, our current dean would have to get 150 letters like this um, soon afterwards. Uh, again, you, you're not going to have exams from five years ago up here because the professors reuse these things. I don't know if you knew that, but they, they do. And uh, I think it, it, was, it was safe enough to have the 1902 uh, contract and agency example up here. And, and again, people who are doing research on the history of legal education um, really love this stuff. The photographs I talked about are, th this is the unfortunate building that burned down uh, 32 years after this, this photograph was taken. It was a really ugly limestone oval thing on, on the, uh, if you have, are familiar with our colonnade or if you go and see it today, uh, you can imagine how out of place it was on the right hand side of the, the colonnade. But we do see some distinguished people there. I see uh, Henry St. George Tucker uh, sitting there. And um, Martin Burks, who went on to uh, UVA. And I uh, found his uh, grave at UVA when I was rooting around there recently. Uh, but anyway, photographs there. I want the stuff. Artifacts, of course, until three printing advances. Although, I must say, if you go to our science center, See the three three D printer that, that's there. It's uh, quite quite amazing. But, but for now, I have to satisfy myself with, uh, and the researchers will have to satisfy themselves with, with uh, images of some of the artifacts. It's from our, our uh, distinguished T-shirt collection, uh, <laughs> which started off mostly with uh, T-shirts from the Dean's Cup. Uh, an enterprising law student uh, had these custom printed M and M's done with the image of our then dean on one side and a third year plan, uh, copyright on that uh, term, uh, on the other. And I was always taught to keep food out of the archives, so I was uh, somewhat <laughs> conflicted by this, but uh, we, we do have them there. Uh, and then there are, there are printed materials. I, I, obvious, copyright is, is something it's already mentioned, and of course that, that always enters in, into these things. But here we see um, some acts of assembly from the time of the recent unpleasantness. But this was actually the um, government installed in, in Washington on behalf of the South, not the Confederate government. This is just a, an entry from one of our yearbooks. Of course, yearbooks are great things. And the front campus already has a complete run of the calyx of the your book in there, and uh, which is great for us because the law school and the undergraduate school 
had, uh, we were both represented in there until well, about 1976, I think. Uh, and then there is the, the things that are more uh, difficult to uh, categorize, but are uh, nonetheless valuable. Uh, on the left, you see a constitution from one of the uh, first established legal aid clinics. Those are, these are the kind of fugitive documents that tend to, to get lost, and uh, this is a, a good place to put them where they can be easily retrieved and, and indexed and so forth. This is uh, a screen capture from a web page. I have this up here. Uh, web archiving, of course, is, is very much <coughs> discussed by archivists these days. But uh, in the meantime, and we do have uh, a subscription to Archivate, we, we do uh, capture our complete uh, law website all the way down, um, I think four times a year. But I don't know if you've had this experience. Uh, we always had paper directories. And so you knew that in 1986, this person was the president of this organization, and in 96. But then last year, we were having a, a seminar uh, on uh, women uh, women represented in the law school activities, uh, law school generally, but some people are doing research in, in our particular law school. But we tried to find some of these things. We Notice, which should have been blindingly obvious to us, that you had the 2010 uh, officers up there, and the 2011 people came in, deleted that, and put their names in. And then they say, well, somebody knows who that was, right? Well, yeah, somebody does, but you'd have to you'd really have to root around to, to find that, and eventually all that would be lost. Um, so another example of, of something we can capture and, and keep in our keeping the repository. Interpreting um, the, the exhibits that, that, that interpret what you have are, are, are very important. Again, I, I had these in HTML format and, and had them uh, on, on my website. Now these things can be uh, captured and made to look very nice by some of the new tools that, that Stephanie is, has discovered and is bringing in. Uh, but also, it's hard to see, especially on this blurry and dark room, here, I don't know what it is. But the, uh, what I have here is a lot of people work very hard on physical uh, exhibits. And while you can't capture that entirely and, and, and store it electronically, I still did take a lot of the things that, uh, um, the panels and, and so forth, and objects that people used, and had images of them and uh, put them in here, and along with uh, some text about the, uh, the background to, to and, and it's a good way to, to uh, capture some of that, that hard work that otherwise just disappears when, when you take it down. Uh, preservation, as, as Caroline mentioned, is, is very important to me as an archivist. And B Press, uh, the, the company that we use, is really very good about using the, um, the best practices and, and keeping up with advances in digital preservation. And they're just constantly updating and putting it in there for you. Now, if you're uh, like our friends from, from UVA, you, you have that own kind of that, that expertise in your own institution. Uh, we, our IT department, is not staffed in a way that we could do that, and so it's it's really comforting and uh, a great advance. And, and that it's the main reason you may say, well, a lot, all this stuff could be delivered on a website, and I was delivering a lot of this by my website, um, still do uh, during this transition period. But this preservation aspect and the sophistication in which, uh, sophisticated way in which you can present this stuff for us can really only be, d be done um, using a tool like this. Uh, of course, it's always gratifying to uh, hear from people. It, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, you know. I, I, um, really enjoy meeting the, the really interesting people who do research in uh, my holdings, and I see them less and less now because they, <laughs> they can do a lot of this virtually. So it is nice to hear back from them that, they're, that things are going, going well and they, they appreciate um, what we're doing here and the stuff's being used. Let me just close by uh, a kind of disclaimer here. 
this is really an example of what a one-person shop can do when you have the sophisticated tool and, and the support of your colleagues. Um, it's, this is not really a digitization project in the sense that it's, it's properly used where you have it, it, it's much more um, sophisticated in the kind of you know, preservation images, which are you know, fairly large, and, and you have the, the user image. And, uh, that's, that's the way things are done ideally, but this is really um, what I could do. I mean, waiting around, as I had been for a long time, for that blue sky day to come when money would drop from heaven and, and there'd be more people to do it. Uh, it just it wasn't going to happen, and, and, and waiting around was no longer uh, an option. And so, as I said, we were serving this worldwide audience uh, with our holdings while preserving the materials uh, as we enter them into the repository. And I think that this is a, a case of good enough uh, in the best sense of that term. So with that, let me uh, return the floor to Stephanie. Okay. Um, so I've said this at least five times already um, since I've been up here, but really uh, we owe a the whole staff um, together uh, made this happen. And we, we don't have a dedicated staff person for the to uh, manage the repository or a scholarly communications um, person on staff. Um, instead, nearly every person has participated uh, in some way, and we're especially lucky today to have many of these people here with us um, uh, today in for this meeting. Um, but when the nature um, of our collection is changing and there's less print and there's more digital, um, the role of our staff members is also changing. So this um, project like this gave opportunity for the staff to use new tools and be an essential product, um, an essential part of a new, of a new project. Um, and so as time um, has passed, as we, we do have eager support from the participation uh, and participation from our dean and our faculty. Um, and everyone involved um, has really seen the increase in the dissemination of the school scholarship um, to the point where it's generated some demand for some uh, related services. And some, some faculty with initial hesitations about duplication with SSRN and competition with SSRN um, and, and having concerns about copyright issues and permissions have come around um, and seeing those, um, they like to see those download counts and, and we all do just um, as a measure of, of our repository um, and, its, and its growth. Um, so one part of that payoff um, for us has been the addition of selected works. And um, we had multiple requests from faculty looking for a way to link to just their work in scholarly comments. We've uploaded 15 of their published articles and they want to send around a link. They want to, um, to make the, allow their readers to download just their work. Um, and so that was something uh, that uh, our, our, our current law school's website wasn't able to do. It wasn't built for that functionality. Um, but it was something that uh, by adding selected works we could provide that additional service. Um, it was a good choice for us because it shares administrative functions with scholarly commons, in particular the ability to import content between platforms, and also allows us to manage the project for faculty, either 100% or in some degree of partnership um, with the administrative tools uh, that's shared between, between these two platforms. Um, this implementation of selected works um, has been a long-term project, but our finished, um, some of our finished selected works profiles have been enthusiastically received um, by the faculty as we work together. And so, um, to wrap up, we'll share a little bit about uh, where we, how far we've come. Um, we have about 4,700 individual items in the repository, downloaded 670,000 times. Um, and our growth is we're adding content. Um, growth is, um, is at an increasing rate. Um, this is total, and this is our faculty, just in our faculty scholarship series. We have um, shy of 300 works have downloaded 31,000 times. And the archives, the Supreme Court case files, um, have been downloaded about 3,200 times, and that's in about 20 months. So we're, we're quite proud. Um, we'll open it up to any questions. Um, well, we really used almost everyone on the staff to do it. I know I've said that so many times. Um, but really keeping, 
um, the meticulous records. I have very large spreadsheets. <laughs> um, but really, um, it's about the open line of communication with our faculty um, in particular, keeping track of what, um, and, and coming up with a system and something that, that will stand going forward. Because after the initial setup, having that flow of information has been the most important so that we know, and we're still struggling with it. We just now set up a new email address for faculty to email us when they have something new that they're doing. But now they know if they email that, then it comes to me and it, and it finds itself on the profile. Um, but I think having, um, having a plan in place that will guide you going forward to the, our, the working plan that we put together has been, um, has been how, we, how we make decisions like that. So writing it all out ahead of time um, and, and using that as a step-by-step -step down the line.
multimedia content is is fairly new um, for for I mean for us and in our plan. So uh, we're we're ironing out some of those hosting issues. Thank you very much.